that we left out what the urban might do for us. Uh, I think John started to address it, saying he was beginning to think about it in his own work where he'd never dealt with the urban before. Um, but it's not so clear to me what, um, how the urban might reshape some of the questions that Michael asked. And I'd like to uh, suggest, and I'm going to approach this from my own discipline of architecture, that the topic of interdisciplinarity is particularly relevant when we're talking about the city because the city drags us, uh, sort of kicking and screaming, outside of the boundaries of what we might like to choose as our uh, metier. And that it's this productive disruption of our disciplinary uh, silos, goals, standards of evidence that um, actually pushes the urban in the hyphenated humanities into a slightly different role than some of the other kinds of uh, productive relationships that um, humanities is entering into. I'd say that the urban actually drags us sort of like a magnet across disciplinary boundaries, but also across the ivy-covered walls that separate public and ac academic interests. And I'm going to particularly look how interdisciplinary urban thinking has appeared in architecture in the post-war era and what the implications might be for urban humanities today. So in case um, you aren't aware of it, the urban is uh, something I would call architecture's metropolitan desire being produced across uh, the globe, basically. These are just books from some of the English-speaking um, universities. The LSE's architects produced the first one, and it moves on through Harvard, Princeton, UCLA. I put myself in the guilty column, the Ankhavada in Vienna. All of these are a kind of undisciplined urban desire, I would say, an engagement with everyday life and with larger, more, a desire to be dealing with larger, more meaningful projects that have some cultural relevance. It's an attempt on the part of architects to formulate the city as a project uh, we know what projects are from a sense of buildings, uh, what buildings, the, the project in the building has a boundary of time, budget, program, site, and we're trying to find out how we can uh, get our hands around something like the urban in order to have a greater impacts and work with larger questions. Um, these have often had somewhat disappointing results and have also proliferated any number of um, categories which, unlike, just like cartography, haven't exactly come together to formulate something that we might call a new discipline, such as urban design. Um, the, it's not just in books, and I think that's why I'd like to shift this conversation out of a purely academic way of thinking things. That in fact, it's the world of action that the urban draws us into, practices that are material practices in the world. These are just a couple of contemporary projects that really raise questions for me. Um, they are projects where I would say architects are attempting to formulate the city as a project. Um, and uh, the first on the left is the shopping mall designer, John Jurdy, who's <coughs> making a shopping mall that's really as much landscape as consumer environment. We might say that that's a step in the right direction, and yet it's eight and a half square acres in the middle of Osaka is something that one could hardly say is operating at the scale of a project. It's really at the scale of a city. And on the right is Sadiyad Island in Abu Dhabi, which really engages all of the, I think, five Pritzker Prize winners. Um, it's like a blue light special um, there, where uh, the master plan is done by the largest firm in the world right now, working on architecture and engineering, AECOM, with uh, all of the pro best architects working together. And what we see is really a project that rolls out, if at all, over 30, 40 years on a tabula rasa, which we know from the modern era has intrinsic problems. So we look at both of these. This is a cultural urbanism on the right, a landscape urbanism on the left, both directions we might say we are interested in forwarding the idea of pieces of the city. Um, and, and is a uh, active practice within design now. Um, I think we also see the urban magnet in design uh, charged 
by the ecological and environmental concerns that are ever present today. And so in some ways, the urban has brought back, in ecological terms, our only chance at utopian discussions again. With all of the problems with which those are fraught, um, we see the kind of uh, Mazdar-like scale of projects here by Norman Foster. Um, and uh, it's not by chance that we see these projects in the Middle East. Architecture in these cases is uh, essentially, intrinsically, and necessarily interdisciplinary. And if there's enough disruption, I think we would begin to see also something that inflects these kinds of urban projects in new ways. And really, that's, in a sense, what we're trying to explore through the work we're doing. How is it that we can bring new inflection and new transdisciplinarity to this metropolitan uh, desire? If the city is a site for disciplinary destruction, uh, disruption, <laughs> might be disruption, destruction also, I think it's because the city has always been viewed as a site of social well-being or as a measure of social well-being, that the health of a community is somehow embodied by the city it, as an object, which we sort of propose that our object is the city. It resists definition, understanding, and coherence. It's what the design theorist Horst Riddle would have called uh, something that embodies our symmetry of ignorance, and it calls for our collective intelligence. And so it's not only the construction of the setting for our everyday lives, but our social construction of everyday life itself both literally and in the Lefebvrean sense. So we're not the first ones to take on this urban uh, challenge. And I just want to look at one uh, historical period from the 40s through the 60s, 70s, to think about how that operated in the past and what parallels there might be today for us. Um, the um, Post-war, widely uh, understood urban crisis was happening at that period. This is actually the book that appears from uh, Joseph Louis Sert, um, uh, just before the war ends. And in that representation, I think he captures, it is the cover of the book, uh, the undesirable conditions of cities, the sardine tin where unpleasant conditions and overcrowding produces the need to escape which in fact led to sprawl, which is shown here in the freeways, and of leaving only poor neighborhoods of color, exacerbating the segregation and deterioration that was already plaguing cities across the United States. Serge was a member of the International Congress of Modern Architecture, SIAM, which had brought the best architects of Europe together during interwar years to reimagine Europe's cities as modern metropolises. Uh, many of those uh, individuals immigrated to the United States during or just after World War II. It was at that time that Sert was appointed to be the head of Harvard's Graduate School of Design, and there where in 1956 he started urban design education. It did not exist prior to that in any kind of formulated uh, curriculum, and you see here just the um, cover of the Harvard Design Magazine celebrating its 50th anniversary. At that moment in time, Siam was in its waning days, and the Cold War thinking of World War II had already restructured and was restructuring global ge geopolitics. Suburban sprawl was rampant, and um, the city as a metaphor of this uh, healthy modern society was fundamentally in question. The answer seemed to be that urban design could actually contribute something because when Sert started the first school in 1956, 40 years later, there were 24 such schools. So those post-war conditions uh, led Kennedy and then especially his successor, Lyndon Johnson, to focus on what this thing we call urban crisis, uh, particularly with the war on poverty. Um, that was a program that was not just about urbanism, but about um, education and housing and economic opportunity. Many of the programs implemented at that time, Head Start, 
uh, the formulation of HUD, Housing and Urban Development Agency, the Economic Opportunity Act, each had real impacts, real and positive impacts, real and mixed impacts. And again, the university's varied intelligence was called for in crossing disciplinary lines and this uh, academic public citizenry line, where faculty, particularly from sociology and education, and in, the, in the fact the newly formed discipline of urban planning, all crossed outside the university to really serve in the <coughs> war as to be among the warriors that would bring intelligence and insight to real plans of action. Uh, as just an aside, the first course about urban planning was offered in 1909, also in Harvard, but its professional organization only began some 50 years later, and that's in fact 50 years after architecture, so planning really emerges kind of at the same period as an organized discipline. It's um, in the decade following the 1964 uh, introduction of the war on property that poverty rates in the United States dropped to their lowest level um, from 17.5% in the year the Economic Opportunity Act was implemented to 11% in 73, and they've basically never been as low since. So I would only like to say that the stakes are real in these cross-disciplinary efforts that have to do with the city, which is why our projects matter and why the conversation amongst us has to be something that we begin to grapple with. Um, so what were the architects doing at this time? Uh, they are often the ones looked at as the guilty parties, but I'd like to show you just this one example, again from Los Angeles, something I've spent some time studying which was from the late 50s. This is Chavez Ravine, uh, which represented the best thinking about urban design at the time um, for uh, public affordable housing. It was the work of a planner, Robert Alexander, along with the architect, Richard Neutra, for 3,000 new units of housing in a kind of utopian pastoral scheme at the edge of downtown Los Angeles. This maybe was one of the finest proposals made in the era of urban renewal, but it also fell victim to some of the same stories and narratives that we have, we know was brought about the end of uh, our ideals in modernist planning. Urban renewal, as perhaps soci sociologists and social scientists would have told us, was uh, actually a violent and consequential um, action in the city against people of color. It ended the modern urban project as we know it. Um, it was an era, I think, of a kind of positivist science that didn't transcend the borders quite fully enough. So uh, our results were ones that seemed to surprise us uh, after uh, making these uh, fantastic drawings to see that it, the consequences weren't ones we could plan for and design for so fully. Well, where were the humanists at this time? They had their own problems <laughs> um, and their own Cold War identities. This is also the era when area studies arise, but funded uh, not only by the federal government, but by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation. Here you just see one transcript from the Ford uh, Rockefeller Foundation about how important area studies are going to be to the new geopolitics. And our young scholar uh, studying Russian documents put aside by um, the Rockefeller Foundation for these kinds of tasks. Um, these were disciplinary disruptions also of a spatial nature because no longer were we studying English or literature, but in fact uh, Russian studies or East Asian studies, languages and cultures brought together around regions. Um, the critique uh, the area studies were said by some to be really a map of Cold War alignments. And the critique has been resounding, coming from the humanists themselves, like Haratunian, uh, introduced to me by my colleague Bill Marotti, um, who uh, says it's been one of the enduring ironies of the study of Asia that Asia itself, as an object, simply doesn't exist. And in Horatunian's uh, resounding critique of area studies, especially coming from a Japanese studies perspective, um, he concludes that it's everyday life studies that will redeem area studies, and, and relies on Lefebvre in that critique 
as the theoretical source for reimagining area studies. And I just want to point out that it's Lefebvre in his book, Right to the City, that really discusses everyday life as equivalent to urban life, bringing us back to the city itself. So the circumstances today, I would just conclude by suggesting they are as profound um, as they were in the post-war era, that our global environmental crisis, along with globalization more broadly, the public doubt about the relevance of higher education in general, uh, the urban century that uh, John Pickles referred to um, in the first session, and I would say also the emergence of big data, uh, its dominance, and its lack of an interpretive critique are the frameworks in which an urban humanities, an urban turn, might once again cause us to ally ourselves. That the city itself is a site for disciplinary disruption is apparent to us in the news every day. And just how we go about laying out <coughs> our claims, our new standards for evidence, um, our new plans at this particularly promiscuous moment within academia seems to me the charge that we have in urban humanities. Thanks.